Thank you, Pastor Craig. Thank you, Pastor Tim. He's been working tirelessly behind the scenes to kind of just make technology work and as things change to try to figure out ways to, to do that. So um, uh, please send your words of encouragement to him and uh, hopefully you're getting a, a good live stream now and yeah, we're able to, to go. Um, God is for us in blessing. That's the, the topic we wanted to talk about this morning. And, and I would acknowledge kind of straight up that maybe it's, it's strange to be talking about blessing in the midst of a global pandemic. Um, is, it, is it strange? Is it even inappropriate? I mean, uh, three, over three million people have been infected. Uh, over 200,000 have died uh, from the COVID virus uh, globally. Um, uh, every one of us have had our employment impacted. It's, it's at least, at the minimum, it's changed. Um, but for some, it's, it's a significant change. Um, we're all living with the uncertainties that uh, are, are around us, the, the, the global economic uncertainties in general, uh, the, the Alberta economic uncertainties specifically. Um, so perhaps suggesting that, that we can find blessing in this is just wishful thinking. Like, is that really what we're engaging in um, here? That, that we can find blessing, that we can note benefit in the midst of difficulty, is, is that deception? Like, are we, uh, are we just kind of trying to talk ourselves, we're saying something bad is good, and we're just, con it's mental trickery. Is that, is that necessary? Um, is it like the hero in uh, the adventure movie? You seen any movies lately? <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's like the hero in the adventure movie, um, uh, who's badly outnumbered and, and, and by bad guys, right? And, and it looks like doom and gloom and all is coming against. And, and they turn and to, to, to their friends there and they say, don't worry, I got this. And we're like, well, the script writers got it anyway. Um, is that what we're doing? Or are we just, is it just wishful think, thinking? Um, we, we've been examining the words of Jesus um, since Easter Sunday. In particular, uh, the Apostle Paul's invitation, Easter Sunday, Acts chapter 2, 50 days after that first Easter weekend, and, and what the Apostle Peter, rather, was saying in that sermon, Acts chapter 2. And, and in particular, we've been trying to take note of the invitation that Peter made to the crowd that day um, to come and, and join the us. Come and become those who were followers of Jesus. He points to the people around and says, we've seen it, we've experienced him, and, and there's this us. And in fact, if we, kind of at the very end of that sermon, the very end of Acts chapter 2, it says that 3,000 people were added to their number that day. 3,000 people said, yes, I believe what I'm hearing. Um, I want to respond to this. Um, it says added to their number. What, what does that mean? <laughs> to be added to their number. Who were the us? Um, and so we've been going back and we've been examining the words of Jesus. So, so what does it mean to respond to Jesus, to say yes to Jesus? We went back to the words that he spoke to his disciples um, uh, just before his trial and then execution. Uh, John chapter, well, the begin, middle of chapter 13 through the end of chapter 17 is what's called Jesus um, Jesus' farewell address, or his farewell discourse. Uh, we've been going back, we've been looking at, at, at segments of that discourse, that address. Uh, we went to John chapter 15, where Jesus describes the us in very organic language. He says, I am the vine, and you are the branches, and together there's going to be a fruitfulness. As my life flows up through me to the branches, and it results in fruitfulness. Um, Last week we looked at John chapter 14. Uh, God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, uh, they're going to move in permanently with us. We even observed the parallels to that. It's, it's intimate. The parallels to marriage. Uh, in a great marriage, increasingly, a husband and a wife, they know one another, and, and there's maybe even a sense of them looking more, they sound more like one another, their, their attitude, their approach to life. Um, husbands and wives become one flesh, physically, emotionally, spiritually. And following Jesus is some parallels to, that, to this. Um, we've been asking questions like, you know, how does following Jesus compare to 
Well, compared to membership in something? Um, uh, how does it compare to uh, family as we think of fraternity or something? How does it compare to believing something like two plus two equals four? And we've been saying all of these are inadequate because it's far more involved and far more invasive than this. And you might be there saying, wow, this is a very demanding relationship um, that, that, that I'm being invited into. Um, it's, it's a big commitment, is it not? And the answer would be yes, yes. Uh, let, let's be clear about what it, what it is that Jesus is inviting us to do in response to him. Uh, it, it is an invasive relationship. It's, a, it's an all or nothing uh, kind of relationship. You're either uh, a branch in the vine or you're not. Uh, you're either uh, uh, with a constant, you have a constant companion, a partner in your home, or, or you don't. And, and so it would be reasonable then to say, well, What's the benefit of this? Like, th this is a pretty holistic invitation. Um, why would I give myself to this? Um, Peter, in that sermon in Acts chapter 2, um, described what was involved. He said, repent of your sin, uh, turn to God, uh, be baptized into Christ Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin. So, so we see this, okay, there's, the, the, there's a response being called for, um, but what are the compelling motivations to accept that response? Uh, so in, in, in answering that query, I, I want to be really, really careful. Um, Christ, the Christian church and evangelicals in particular, which I would consider myself to be one, um, have been guilty of kind of playing to this strength I would suggest in excess uh, over the course of, of the, the, the past years, o over the, the past decades, maybe longer, uh, we have increasingly been in a society that is, is consumeristic. Um, we, we are people who are assessing cost and benefit. Um, do I want to buy that? Um, is it helpful? Um, what does it do for me if I buy it? Is the benefit to the purchase, um, does it make sense? Um, and, and over that period of time, I think increasingly evangelicals have been able to point to Jesus and say, well, that's an easy sell. <laughs> I mean, Jesus is beautiful. He's a wonderful. Like, why would we not, you know, be, be inviting people to respond uh, in, to Jesus? Um, the problem is Jesus is not a commodity. Um, and this is, does not uh, simply come down to a cost-benefit kind of analysis. And, and one of the problems when we present the gospel in a consumer society is that people hear it through consumer sort of ears. They see it through consumer kinds of eyes, and they see the invitation to follow Jesus as, as the invitation to make an informed purchase. Um, we, we like that as consumers, right? Um, it, it's an invitation to evaluate the options, and, and of all the options that are out there, uh, become, uh, make an astute, clever, very discerning shopper decision. Um, that's how consumerism works. We, 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 we take some pride in the, the good deal that I got on that, and it was, it was good value for dollar invested. The, the problem is Jesus can't be bought, and, and if he could, the currency necessary, I'm, I'm utterly bankrupt in, in it. Emotionally, morally, spiritually, like any of the things that I would suggest are to my credit, or to my value that I bring to the relationship, are, are, are nothing compared to the surpassing greatness, the, 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 great, the great value that is to be found in Jesus. And so as we, as we ask them questions around blessing and around value, and around the things that we receive from this union with Christ, this joining together with Jesus. We've got to be super careful because we're, we're inclined to hear these things through the eyes of consumers, through the ears of consumers, and, and, it, and it affects us. And, we, and so we have to come and say, firstly, this is not a, a purchase decision. Uh, this is... I was utterly bankrupt when Jesus found me. Uh, I had nothing, nothing, nothing to my merit that would engender him to me, that would cause him to say, Terry, boy, you know, he, he, he can do some things well, he has these values, uh, I'm going to choose him. None of it. Like, he didn't choose me because of anything that I could bring that would merit his attention. 
When Jesus found me, I was utterly desperate to be rescued out of a broken situation. I was utterly desperate to be restored in relationship to the Father so that I could experience the wholeness that he intended me to have when he created me, but which a broken, fallen world has rendered impossible outside of Jesus. And so the invitation to follow Jesus is an invitation to wholeness. It's an invitation to be restored in relationship to the Father. It's an invitation to be reconciled not with God and with those around me. And in this vine branch relationship, I, I, I enter into this union with Christ and become fruitful. Benefit comes. I enter into this intimate relationship that, 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 that's akin to marriage. Uh, someone with me, walking there intimately, on my side, increasingly I'm looking like him. Uh, these are, it's, it's benefit, it's beautiful, it's a wonderful thing. And, and clearly, I would argue strongly that you will never regret having said yes to Jesus and entered in, entering into the us relationship with him. And those of us who have said yes to Jesus uh, we're commissioned by Jesus to issue this invitation over and over and over again. Come, join us, be part of the us, be a branch in the vine, come and be a resident in the house with Jesus. And in this, you will experience blessing. In particular, Jesus in his farewell discourse identifies peace and joy is that which you will receive. Now let me read some of these words of Jesus for you. I'm in John chapter 14, verse 27. If you've downloaded your sermon notes, you can follow along. I'd encourage you to do that. There's some questions on the back that you could reflect on uh, this afternoon or through the course of this week. But here we go. John chapter 14, verse 27. I'm reading from the New International Version. If you're looking it up digitally, it'll be on the screen here. Um, the, the first thing that Jesus is inviting, he's inviting you to receive peace. John 14, 25. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Lord, we just want to enter into your words and have them enter into us this morning. Holy Spirit, come and teach us, we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. We, uh, we typically think of the word peace as an absence of conflict. Uh, it's an ending of hostilities, right? Uh, a nation was at war, now they're at peace with that nation. Uh, uh, my wife and I had a struggle, uh, but we resolved that and we are at peace with one another. An, an ending of hostilities. Uh, and Jesus has enabled that between us and God the Father, and that's what that first Easter was all about. We'd been separated from God by sin. Uh, it was necessary for Jesus to come and restore that relationship for us. It's one of the reasons why we celebrate Easter and would say the Easter weekend is the highest, uh, sort of the greatest weekend on the Christian calendar, if you will. Every human being who turns to God and trusts in Jesus uh, for the forgiveness of their sin, trusts that Jesus can actually do this, uh, will be reunited with the Father peace. Uh, no more separation, no more, more conflict. God's grace is so great, his favor towards you and me is so great that he forgives us the, our, our sin through that work, on account of that work of Jesus, um, uh, and we have peace with God. Uh, but that's not exactly the peace that Jesus is talking about here. So one sort of peace is an absence of, of hostilities, an absence of enemies, but the other kind of peace is freedom from anxiety while still struggling with enemies. Freedom from anxiety while still in the middle of uh, conflict, still in the middle of, of storm. 
You see, it's rather easy to have peace when there's no trouble. But what Jesus has in mind here is peace in the middle of the storm, peace while continuing to struggle with my enemies. And so that brings up kind of this, this word, survival. How do you survive in the midst of conflict, in the midst of threat, in the midst of, 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 of stress? Uh, if you're a fan of, of literature, you've seen it in writing, the, the classic struggles for survival that, 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 that come out in our storytelling. Maybe you've seen a movie lately, <laughs> right? Uh, they come out in our storytelling. Uh, man versus nature, struggle for survival. Um, man versus machine, struggle for survival. Human beings versus injustice. And, and this struggle for survival is as old as the human story. And here we are in, in the middle of a global pandemic, a, a very literal struggle for survival, uh, a threat to our health, a threat to our uh, financial stability. I mean, it's rather easy to be at peace when there's no trouble. Uh, Anna and I celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary on Tuesday. Um, over the last 30 years, we've been blessed to have three hot destination vacations together. Uh, one was our, um, one was our, our honeymoon, and, and then on our uh, round about our 20th wedding anniversary, we got away uh, uh, to Mexico. Um, around our 25th, uh, we got away again together. Um, in all three of those, we chose one of those all-inclusive kinds of resorts. Um, it, was, it was wonderful. We had fabulous vacations uh, together. Um, one of the reasons that made it wonderful for us was an absence of the man versus or human beings versus financial struggle, right? All-inclusive. Um, you pay one price up front, and if you want a beverage, you get a beverage. Uh, if you want food, you go and ask for food. Um, if you want a beach chair, well, you might have to stand in line for that, um, right? Um, if you've done that, you kind of know. But, but generally speaking, it, it's kind of covered. And, and we've, God has always given us everything that we needed and not usually an awful lot more. And so we're careful, you know, do, we, do I really need that beverage? You know, do I, am I going to buy the more expensive item on the you know, restaurant menu, or I'm going to buy something that's a little less expensive? We wouldn't think about those things. We just, there was an absence of struggle. I mean, it's easy to experience peace in that kind of environment. But Jesus here is talking about serenity in the midst of confusion. Jesus is talking about finding uh, peace while you are managing stress. Uh, while you are in the midst of not knowing. In fact, I, it, it was easy to argue that that kind of peace, well, that's got value, right? It's, it's more valuable than the peace in the absence of trouble kind of situation. Uh, this is enormously valuable if I can, in the midst of a world that is broken and falling apart, there are there's difficulties here, there, and everywhere. Uh, Jesus is saying, look, peace and trouble do not negate one another. They're not antithetical. They're, they're not opposites. They, they, they can coexist. There can be peace in the midst of trouble. The, the peace of Jesus is a condition, it, it's a, a situation that takes the uncertainties and the struggles of this world seriously. Uh, he's not just writing it off. He's not just ignoring it. He's not saying that it's not a real thing. But what he is saying is it's, it's maybe a little bit like uh, the, the seagull that, that rides the surface of even a turbulent sea and is able to rise above every crest and then into the valley again, and, and we are able to supersede uh, the circumstances because of this peace. And we say, well, how is that possible? John 14, Jesus told his disciples, verse 23, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching, my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. So this is why we can have peace. God is dwelling with us. And he's making this kind of peace possible. And Jesus is very real. He's not saying the hostilities in our world don't exist. In fact, he acknowledges them. He says, even especially for followers of Jesus, disciples of this world are going to experience struggle. We're going to experience conflict, even battle. And these are conflicts uh, 
These are conflicts between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. There's a different value system there. The world, its values, its visions, its morals, the world's sort of pagan approach to, to kind of pagan religious instinct, they're in at hostility against God of the Bible and the way God presents himself. And in a sense, following Jesus is actually going to be a call to warfare. Pastor Donald Miller, a sermon that I came across this week, he writes this, As long as a Christian is in the world, he will be pressed as though by a great mob. He will be crushed in spirit as though great crushing weights were lying on his chest. He will know spiritual anguish like that of a mother in labor. This Jesus has told us. But Jesus speaks, therefore, of peace. It is not the peace of unruffled days, but the inner confidence of the warrior who is weary. It's the inner confidence of the warrior who is thirsty, is outnumbered, and is wounded, but who fights bravely on, confident of the outcome, assured of victory. We're saved not from trouble, we are saved in trouble. And so Jesus warns us as disciples to expect storms, expect difficulties, but peace is to be found in this union with Christ. It's the product of this mutual indwelling relationship. God in us, we in him, there will be peace. John 16, verse 33. The time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered. He's describing conflict. He's describing difficulty. You will be scattered each to your own home. Sound familiar? <laughs> you will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Take heart. Some of your translations will say, have courage. Now this this sounds a little different depending on who you are and depending on who speaks it to you. Um, they're going to open the golf courses. I know some of you are, are going to be thrilled. Um, there was a time when I would have counted myself in there, except golf and I have always had kind of a love-hate relationship. The harder I worked on my game, the worse it seemed to get. <laughs> um, uh, but imagine, if you're a golfer, that, that Tiger Woods comes along, a great professional golfer, and, and, and says, it's okay. You know what, you can get a hole in one there. I've got a hole in one on that hole, on that hole myself. Uh, you, can golf, you can golf par. Uh, I, I golf par all the time. And then walks away. That's like, pfft. well, thanks, Tiger, right? You know, a lot of good that did me. Actually, it probably discouraged me. You know, it's like the, it's like the, the, the A-plus student who comes out of the exam and says to someone like me, um, I, I nailed it. Uh, you can too. Uh, I'm just not that smart. Um, but thanks anyway. So, so if, if Jesus is this superhuman, this superhero uh, who, has, who, who has prevailed, uh, if Jesus is simply this, this hero who has achieved a superior life, and, 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 and it's therefore a stellar example of what I am to hope to be, uh, that's got no value to me. I, I mean, I've tried to overcome the world and I've failed. Jesus' example as a, a superior human being simply kind of underscores my own inferiority. It almost makes it unbearable if somebody did it, but I can't. But if Jesus is more than human, if Jesus is indeed the Son of God who overcame the world, not simply for his own sake, but for our sake as well, for all of humanity, if his victory in this life can be your victory, can be my victory to be enjoyed. Well, this is a whole different thing. His victory extended to us when we embrace him, when we are found in Christ. Well, then the triumph, his triumph becomes my triumph. 
Jesus is offering genuine good news in this invitation to come and follow him. And then he says, have courage. I faced the enemy and I vanquished him. I have fought the battle on the battlefield of human experience where it must be fought. And I have routed the foe. You you can never do it. But I have done it. And I can do it again in you. So join me. Abide in me. And my victory is yours. See, that's peace. That is peace. Peace with God because Christ made it possible. And then peace in us, in the midst of the battle, in the midst of the storm, in the middle of the pandemic, through the economic recovery, whatever that's going to look like. Jesus is inviting you to receive peace. And, Jesus says, he's inviting you to receive joy. (laughs) Is that precocious or what? right? Oh my goodness, peace and joy? Look what he says, John 15 verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This whole union with Christ experience brings, well, it brings Jesus joy. Right? Hebrews tells us that it was for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. You were that joy. Jesus gets joy out of this because he saw you on the other side of the cross and he persevered through the pain and suffering of the cross in order, in order that he would have you, in order that he'd be in relationship with you. But here what he's saying is that his joy becomes my joy. His joy becomes your joy. A little further on in Jesus' farewell address, he was praying to the Father about us, for us. Here's what he says in chapter 17, verse 13. He says, Lord, I'm coming to you. So, Father, I'm coming to you now. But I say these things while I am still in the world so that they, us, his followers, may have the full measure of my joy within them. Can we even contain the full measure of Jesus' joy? Like, I bet you he's got a big scoop. I bet you that's a big measure. I, I ate a lot, of, uh, a lot of meals at my in-law's home when Ann and I were dating. Um, uh, and when I was there for a dinner, it, it took me a while to clue into this, but I was often handed the ice cream scoop uh, when dessert came around. Now, what I came to understand was, I guess, on one of the first visits when I was there, just trying to be helpful, I said, sure, I'll scoop the ice cream, and, and, and did so. Apparently, I was rather generous with the portions that I scooped out. And, and so, from that point on, her brothers were like, oh, Terry can scoop the ice cream. Um, apparently, the, the, they appreciated the generous proportions. I don't know if her dad did, but... <laughs> um, Jesus has a generous scoop, man. Like, can you imagine the full measure of Jesus' joy? Like, this is what's being offered to us. Now, now, note this is more than just happiness. Like, like, it includes happiness, but it's it's not just about happiness. This is is something that's so much more than, this is a spiritual conversation, and these are spiritual connections, vine to branch, bringing fruitfulness. It's, it's, It's God abiding with us, Jesus the groom, and we, his bride, living together, growing together. This is God in us. He's the hope of glory. We're going to talk about this through all eternity. Like, man, this is so immense. And if we don't even just scratch the surface of this right now. And yet, and yet, I I have my moments. In fact, I have my days when I'm anything but peace-filled I'm anything but joyful. What's wrong with me? Maybe you've asked that question. 
right? Like, like, like there are days when I feel like I am in the world and the world is in me and that's it, full stop. And rather than, than peace, I, I, I'm experiencing frustration, I'm experiencing confusion. Rather than joy, I, I'm angry, I, I'm short-tempered. What, what, what's wrong with me? Chapter 14, verse 25. Listen to what Jesus says. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Do you get that? God has given himself to you. God, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the advocate, the helper, the comforter, forte from the Latin meaning to equip and resource and embolden, counselor, he's given himself to you and there's going to take, there's going to be some process here. It's going to take time. And in fact, we will spend our entire lives becoming more like Jesus. This process of becoming, of looking like Jesus requires time with Jesus. Note this, verse 27, peace I leave with you. So this is all connected. I'm giving you the advocate. He's going to be with you. He's going to teach you all things. He's going to remind you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Thank you, Lord. He says, I do not give as the world gives do not let your heart be trou- troubled. Do not be afraid. In fact, if we go over to chapter 16, verse 33, he says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus says, take heart. Some of your translations will be, take courage. I have overcome the world. This is the hero speaking, who's faced the overwhelming odds And he's turning to us as friends. He says, I've got this. In fact, this is the hero who comes back out of the successful battle and says, I've got this. In Christ, I have peace. In the world, I have trouble. But take courage, take heart, because Jesus says, I've overcome the world. Jesus has instructed his disciples with this kind of language before. Take courage. I don't know if you remember Matthew chapter 8. Jesus was, on, uh, was asleep in the boat with his disciples in the middle of a stormy sea. These seasoned fishermen were terrified. They thought they were going to die, and they woke Jesus up in a panic. And he calmed the storm. And do you remember what he, what he said to them? Do you remember what he, he had kind of a pet name that he had for them? He, he called them Little Faith. Little Faith. And in that portion of the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Matthew's been showing us that there are some who have great faith, and there's, there's some who have little faith. Just a little while on, Matthew chapter 14 happens again, similar, uh, the disciples are in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, a terrible storm, and and Jesus comes walking across the water to them. They're afraid, and Jesus says these very words. He says, take courage. Take courage. And so Peter took him literally. He took courage, and he stepped out of the boat, and he walks to Jesus. He took courage until he let go of courage. He looked, and he saw the water, he saw the waves, woo, down, he was under the water. Jesus grabbed his hand, pulled him back up, little faith. Well, these guys whom Jesus would call little faith would eventually become great faith. Like they would become men of enormous faith. And God would use them extraordinarily, but it takes time. It's process. There's some work to be done. Uh, there, there, we need to linger with Jesus if, if we're going to increasingly find that, that we're experiencing his joy in the midst of the conflict, that we're experiencing his peace in the midst of the struggle. But Jesus is the one who invites us to look to him. Don't look at the storm. Don't look at the waves. Don't look at the wind. Look, look at Jesus. I want to fix my eyes on Jesus, the one who's overcome the world. And, and so rather than giving way, and, and I've done it, rather than giving way to the frustrations, you know, another COVID restriction, good grief. You know, uh, uh, 
house feels too small, maybe. Um, you know, another cancellation of something that I was looking forward to. Um, rather than giving way to those frustrations and looking at the wind and looking at the waves, I, I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus. Against all odds, Jesus has prevailed. Maybe that's why we love the hero, hero movies. <laughs> you know, in some way, shape, or form, you know, the, the, the hero who prevails is this imperfect reflection of, of Jesus himself and, and is reminding us, somebody's got this. So in, in my moments of anger or, or confusion, I, I'm going to train myself to look to Jesus. I'm going to remind myself time and again. In my moments of frustration, in moments of anger, moments of frustration, moments of, of confusion, looking to Jesus. In my moments of sadness, uh, those moments when I experience loss, I want to I train myself to look to Jesus and take courage, take heart. Because the more I fix my gaze on Jesus, the author, the perfecter of my faith, the greater my courage becomes. Let me just be super practical as I wrap this up. So, some of you may be saying, Look, this is a huge challenge for me. I, I do not have peace in the midst of what I'm experiencing right now. Uh, joy is the furthest thing from, from my life's experience right now. Well, why, why don't you do this? Uh, list, qualify, surrender. Okay, that, that's what, Make a list. Make a list of the things that are stressing you. What, what are the things that are stressing me out? What is it that's, that's, that's really troubling me right now? Um, and then divide that list into two categories. Those that you can't do anything about because they're completely out of your control, and those that you, uh, you have some control over, you have some say in this. Val Tompkins who was a Christian counselor that many of us um, found super helpful to us, went to be with the Lord in January. She had this little metaphor that she would use. Uh, she would say, you know what, the swimmer uh, who gets caught in a riptide in the ocean uh, if they try to swim against the current and fight it, we'll drown. But if they will ride the current and conserve their energy and wait for the Coast Guard to rescue them, they, have, they, they, can, they will survive. Um, so, so ride the riptide uh, was, the, was this little metaphor. For, you know, if you can't do anything about it, get in the, you know, you're in the caught in the riptide, you're going to rest in peace, the riptide. So, so we're, that's a category over there, and we're going to make a choice about those things that we can't do anything about. I can't, can't change it, so, so I'm just going to ride the riptide. Um, but there's another category of things where you do have some, some control. There, there are some things that you can do in the midst of that. And, and so those ones, what you want to do is qualify them. So I'm going to list, I'm going to qualify. Um, what are the things that I'm going to keep? Maybe it's difficult, but I'm going to keep them. That's as good as it's going to get. Or maybe it's difficult, but it's, it's working a good purpose in my life. Through. So there's some I'm going to keep. There's some I'm going to modify. I need to make some changes here. We can modify those. And there's some I'm going to discard. Like, it's just not worth the time, not worth the... I'm going to get rid of that one. Right? So, so I make a list. I qualify it. And then I'm going to bring all of this work that I've done, I'm going to bring it back, and I'm going to surrender it to Jesus again. Lord Jesus, what, I want you to have the final say on this. Uh, I want you to speak some truth into this. How do, how do we do have that conversation? Uh, RTR. Uh, read scripture. Talk to saints. Talk to other followers, good, solid followers of Jesus. R, T, -T talk. Reflect intentionally. Reflect intentionally. Read scripture. Uh, Come back to the texts that we've been looking at here this week. Uh, what was God saying to me? Uh, the sermon notes ha have an invitation to memorize some scripture uh, on the bottom of them. Uh, begin to just pour scripture in so that you know it and allow God to speak through that. The Holy Spirit is delighted to speak to us through his word. Uh, read scripture. Talk to, talk to saints. Talk to followers of Jesus. Talk to those who are, who are secure. Have real godly wisdom to bring to you. We're trying to discern the voice of Jesus here as we surrender this work that we're doing. Talk to, to followers of Jesus and then, and then reflect intentionally. Like not just sort of occasional thoughts, but you know, journal some stuff. Write down your thoughts if that's a helpful process to you. Uh, meditate on those things. Uh, uh, find some times of solitude where you can really get away and really focus on, on, 
Lord Jesus, what is it that you want me to do in this circumstance? Why am I so stressed? Why do I not, am I not experiencing your peace? Uh, experience some Sabbath. You know, a, a day, today, maybe it's today, where, where you just, I'm going to worship, I'm going to focus on Jesus, and I'm, I'm going to set aside the things that busy me the other six days of the week. Make a list, qualify it, and then surrender it back to Jesus. RTR, read scripture, talk, reflect intentionally. The Apostle Paul says, always rejoice, constantly pray, in everything give thanks. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. Always rejoice, constantly pray, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Jesus was with his disciples in the boat when they were caught in the storm. He came to Peter, uh, and Peter walked on the water. Uh, he, he, he endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. That's you. He is coming to you, and he wants to give you his joy. He wants to give you his peace. This is what he's offering to us, and then it's about a choice that we need to make. The first choice, of course, is to, is, is to begin. It's to repent of our sin. It's to turn to God. The related choice, then, is to abide. I'm going to live in this relationship. I'm going to become branch in the vine. I'm going to be, become co-inhabitants with Jesus in my home uh, where he is with me. Uh, I'm, I'm going to enter into what, what would be described as the best of human marriages, where we are partners together. And in this, I'm called to take courage, take heart, and, and receive his peace and be full of his joy. Now, I'm going to train myself to persistently, relentlessly, tirelessly look to Jesus. 